I'm Garrett Cullity, Professor of Philosophy at the ANU. Um, and what I'm going to do is offer a short overview of the moral case for stronger Australian action. I expect the broad lines of that case will be familiar to everyone, but it's worth recognising that it actually consists of several independent arguments, all pointing in the same direction. The discussion paper that we've put together uh, sets out five of these, um, and I'll just go through them and add a few remarks about the differences between them and their overall strength. So the first of these arguments concerns the harm that's now being done by global warming. The estimates we have for this from the World Health Organization and other epidemiologists give us excess mortality figures now running into hundreds of thousands annually and figures for lost disability adjusted life years in the millions. Now, if that sounds tolerable, they're global figures after all, and our contribution is a small percentage of the global total, then we have to remember that these are annual figures and the IPCC tells us that the greenhouse gases we've put into the atmosphere already will stay there, producing similar effects if we do nothing about it for more than a millennium. So we have to multiply those figures by a factor of a thousand before figuring out our 1.3% contribution, which is actually more like 4% if you include coal exports. If so, there's already a significant amount of harm being produced by our current activities and we should be doing what we can to reduce it. That's the first argument. The second is an argument from risk. This doesn't rely on any current contribution to harm. Instead, it appeals to the risk of much worse, more severe consequences in the future if we carry on the current path. An argument of this second kind applies to action under circumstances of uncertainty. Uncertainty of the sort reflected in the IPCC's modelling of different possible trajectories that might continue from here. In ordinary moral thought, failing to take precautions against inflicting serious harm under conditions of uncertainty is criticised as negligence or recklessness. And this is independent of whether any harm actually results from it. Third, there's an argument from burden sharing. This simply points out that action to mitigate climate change is a global public good. Failing to contribute an equitable share of the burden of producing a public good is free riding. It treats the other cooperators unfairly. This is wrong for the same kind of reason that tax evasion is wrong. The failure to contribute on the same terms as others is unfair, whether or not it harms anyone. When we apply this argument to global climate action, it does invite the question, what distribution of burdens is equitable? And here, several different factors are important. These include the size of our contribution to causing the problem, the development benefits we've derived from past emissions, and our cooperative capacity to take action. But all of these point towards assigning a higher per capita share of the burden of global climate action to Australia than to countries that have emitted less, are less developed, and have less capacity to act. Now, these first three arguments mainly concern the relationship between Australians and non-Australians. The first two concern the harm or risk we are imposing on other global citizens. And the third argument concerning burden sharing relates to our unfair treatment of those who are doing more than we are to try to solve the problem. So if you thought that Australian social and economic policy ought to be focused on the interest of Australians and ignore the impact of our actions on non-Australians, you could ignore those first three arguments. It's hard to believe that's really morally okay. But anyway, even if you set aside the first three arguments, there are two others that solely concern impacts in Australia. One is an argument from national protection. Global climate inaction will have impacts on future generations of Australians that are too large to be neutralised through adaptation measures, even in countries as relatively affluent as ours. If so, we have a duty to future Australians to join the global action required to protect their interests. Future generations will be entitled to ask what efforts we made to head off the problems they confront. As is emphasised elsewhere in the discussion paper, this includes supporting and stimulating global efforts and providing leadership. 
Then finally, there's an argument from national prudence. Given the reality of climate change, there will eventually have to be economic disruption to deal with it. This gives us a choice. The disruption could be delayed until it's forced on future Australians, producing the need for massive and costly change later, or it can be introduced earlier, more incrementally, and in a way that's more easily absorbed. This can be described as an argument from national prudence or self-interest, but it is also an intergenerational moral argument. If we accept that we're now morally answerable to future Australians for the foreseeable impact on them of our current decisions, we should begin the process now. So those are the five arguments. I'll just finish with a comment about their strength. Sometimes there are strong moral reasons to do things, but it's so costly for you to do them that morality doesn't require it of you, all things considered. Instead, we say it's heroic or saintly. That doesn't seem to apply here if the rest of the report is right. There are significant potential advantages to Australia in moving to a low emissions economy. And this actually makes the moral arguments harder to answer. So that's it from me, and I'll hand over now to Ken Henry.